Suppose that you have a really good idea that you think can revolutionize the world of science. You decide to go to one of the best scientists in your field to share your enthusiasm and get some constructive feedback and maybe admiration. This is actually the face of the brilliant scientist after our young student explained his theory to him. It's not a promising face, but what do you expect him to have said? Sometimes great minds need more time to think about your ideas and that would be a great pleasure to see them thinking about what you have said. It just feels like you're becoming a new star in your field, just one step closer to the scientific fame and maybe the Nobel Prize, who knows? It can even go further, you might become the new genius by the new concepts you introduce to the community. And it all can start by collaborating with a great mind like him, becoming like him, someone who people like to listen to. All of a sudden, what you just hear is that your suggestion is not good enough to serve you in what you had just fantasized about. You feel devastated, you just drop the idea and get disappointed. You don't even talk about it anymore. The fact that one of the most famous scientists of the time has brutally criticized your theory is enough to doubt yourself and stop fighting for your ideas. Nine months later, two other scientists independently come up with the same ideas you had just come up with nine months earlier, and this is their professor's reaction. You are both young enough to allow yourself some foolishness, guys. Publish your idea, but don't take it too seriously. They published their idea in 1925, and it turned out to be a great one and revolutionized the world of quantum physics. Now, let me introduce these guys who were all great scientists of their time and made a lot of contributions to physics. This is the 21-year-old Ralph Kronick who proposed the idea in early 1925. He presented the idea to Wolfgang Pauli, one of the brightest minds of that time, who was known as a star and had written a 237-page review paper on general relativity in 1921, and even Einstein used it as a reference because of its clarity and depth. At this time, Pauli was just 25 years old. The two scientists who published the idea we are going to talk about were George Ullenbeck, who was 25, and Samuel Goodesmith, 23. They published their paper in late 1925. And finally, born in 1880, Paul Ehrenfest, was one of the best teachers of the time and one of the best friends of Einstein. He helped his students come up with the idea of spin and encouraged them to be bold enough to publish their novel ideas. Ironically, despite all the great things he did in his life, drowned in depression, he finally decided to end his life because he didn't feel he had accomplished enough in physics. A tragic end for a great man who was called the man anyone wanted in the room when brilliant scientists wanted to discuss the foundations of modern physics. The idea we have been talking about is spin, an intrinsic angular momentum that generates a magnetic field that can interact with external fields. Like mass and charge, it was proposed to be considered as a fundamental property. Before diving into the concept of spin, let's take a moment and think about how some extraordinary human beings with their ordinary lives, change our understanding of the world around us. Some of them became the stars and some of them helped the others to get better and even some of them might have been forgotten in the course of history. This is what Einstein wrote in the obituary of his beloved friend Ehrenfest. He was not merely the best teacher in our profession whom I have ever known, he was also passionately preoccupied with the development and destiny of men, especially his students, to understand others, to gain their friendship and trust, to aid anyone embroiled in outer or inner struggles, to encourage youthful talent. All this was his real element, almost more than his immersion in scientific problems. Think about the last sentence, his real element was to encourage young talents to overcome scientific problems. This is exactly what he had done for Ullenbeck and Goodesmith and for many other great minds. 
Sometimes, when I think about how people came up with these novel ideas in science and I read about what they have done and how many people they have reached out to, I realize that it's not fair to say this theory was developed by this specific scientist only. It's always more complex than it seems, even in the case of Pauli, who stopped Kronik from publishing his ideas. He could have published them anyway and fight for what he had believed was true. But was it his fault? Think about how he was brought up and all the background he had that led to dropping his ideas on the spin. Who knows? To understand why these young scientists came up with the idea of a spin, first we need to take a look at an experiment that was carried out by Zeman. And the effect you're about to see is called the Zeman effect. The 30-year-old scientist, whose mentor and PhD advisor had been Lawrence, was trying to continue Faraday's unfinished work on finding how magnetic fields can have effects on light. He also wanted to test Lawrence's electron theory experimentally. Lawrence had proposed four years earlier that magnetic fields should alter the motion of electron and consequently affect the emitted light. Zeeman's experiment consists of a source of light which emits white light through another source of light that produces the vapor of an element we want to experiment on which is in a magnetic field. And finally, a diffraction grating which acts like a prism and splits light into its constituent wavelengths. When we pass the light through this setup in which the magnet is turned off and there is no lamp, the light splits into all possible wavelengths of visible light. This is called the spectrum of white light. When we put a lamp with cadmium vapor and pass the white light through its vapor, which is not affected by magnet, we can see a dark line in the red part of the spectrum. But when we turn on the magnet while passing the light through the vapor, three dark lines appear, which is consistent with the theory proposed by Lorentz. Lorentz's classical electron theory predicted that a magnetic field would split spectral lines into three components, or a triplet, due to the Lorentz force acting on orbiting electrons. This splitting is called normal Zeeman effect. The most amazing thing happens when we do the same experiment with sodium vapor. Instead of one line, there would be two spectral lines, which later was called the fine structure. Now, if we turn on the magnet, there will be four to six spectral lines based on how strong the magnetic field is. This was called the anomalous Zeeman effect, which couldn't be explained by Lorentz's model. Even later, the model proposed by Bohr and Sommerfeld couldn't explain the fine structure and anomalous Zeeman effect. In 1925, Ralph Kronig proposed that electrons possess an intrinsic angular momentum that today we call spin to explain the anomalous Zeeman effect and fine structure in atomic spectra. He suggested that electrons rotate about their own axis, generating a magnetic moment independent of orbital motion. When Pauli heard the idea, he couldn't accept it because if an electron wants to rotate about its axis and create the angular momentum S of h bar divided by 2, because of the tiny radius of an electron considered to be a sphere, a point on the sphere would have to move at a very high speed, close to 5 times 10 to the power of 10. We know that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8, and this calculated the speed of rotation of an electron would be 100 times more than the speed of light, which violates the special relativity and is not possible. Even when Ullenbeck and Goodsmith proposed the concept of spin nine months later, Pauli couldn't accept the idea. They proposed that the spinning charge generated a magnetic dipole moment that could explain why electrons interact with a magnetic field. In fact, they had introduced a new angular momentum called spin angular momentum, which was either plus or minus h bar divided by two. To resolve anomalous Zeeman effect, they had to set a factor two to be included in the equation which was called the spin g factor. Pauli couldn't still accept the concept of electron rotation around its axis because it violated special relativity. In fact, he couldn't accept this concept 
based on classical notions associated with angular momentum. Later, spin was treated as a quantum property, a purely quantum degree of freedom. Even considering spin as a quantum property with the G factor 2 we talked about caused problems when they calculated the energy of an electron in the presence of electric potential of the nucleus. The spin orbit interaction energy calculated by theory was half of what experiments suggested. In 1926, Leland Thomas showed that when an electron moves in an electric field, for example around a nucleus, special relativity introduces an additional effect that modifies the spin orbit interaction. In fact, Thomas introduced an additional relativistic rotation of the spin axis that caused the electron's spin to precess. Imagine a spinning top that spins and wobbles at the same time while spinning around itself. This wobble corrected the spin orbit energy and accounted for why the actual energy was the half of what a naive introduction of spin would present. In 1927, Pauli was finally persuaded to accept the concept of spin and introduce some Hermitian matrices that were the representation of spin operators in quantum mechanics. In this formalism, the wave function of electron became a two-component spinner in which psi plus and psi minus correspond to a spin-up and a spin-down states, respectively. Finally, in 1928, Paul Dirac proposed the relativistic quantum mechanics and spin turned out to be a natural consequence of merging relativity with quantum theory. In this framework, unlike the Schrodinger equation that involves a wave function, for an electron we deal with four component spinners and two of these components correspond to a spin-up and a spin-down electron. And this is how a spin was naturally introduced the theory of relativistic quantum mechanics.